Okay, so uh, welcome all to this uh, SIB uh, Virtual Computational Biology Seminar Series, which is the last one before the summer break. So, <laughs> so we're going to see you back in, um, in September. Um, and today, for this last talk, we have the pleasure to uh, host uh, here in Lausanne, uh, uh, Hubert uh, Rehauer from the Functional Genomics Center Zurich at the uh, affiliate to the ATH Zurich and the University of Zurich. Uh, uh, Hubert studied uh, physics at the University of uh, Würzburg in Germany, and his main interest there was in the computational modeling of statistical physics. After his di di diploma, sorry, he joined the ETH Zurich for a PhD in image data mining, and in 2000 he shifted to life sciences and joined um, the company Gene Data as a scientific uh, consultant, where he developed algorithm and software solution for the bi-emerging field of microarray, uh, expression microarrays. And in 2005, he joined uh, as bioinformatician the Functional Genomics Center Zurich, where he currently holds uh, the group leader position in genome informatics. And uh, Uber is also a group leader of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So his group at the Functional Genomics Center collaborate with researchers on the analysis of next generation sequencing data and the group uh, provides web-based analysis to the research community, as well as custom development of analysis pipelines. The group supports the analysis of virtually all NGS applications based on data produced by any recent, recent sequencing technology. And the group also trains uh, researchers and bioinformaticians uh, on various aspects of data analysis and provide access to their computing infrastructure for running analysis. So today, Uber will tell us how single-cell RNA sequencing platforms perform. And uh, I want to thank you again for accepting this invitation. And the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello, everybody here in, the, in this room. And hello, everybody who is virtually online and follows the, the, uh, this presentation in a different place. So yes, today I'm... Uh, talk about uh, some compare performance comparison that we did to together with other research groups on uh, platforms that uh, allow single cell RNA seq. Uh, the outline of my talk is as follows. I will quickly repeat what we are doing, <laughs> uh, but it's not going to be too long. When I will introduce these uh, single cell platforms and shortly mention how this has been evolved. Also mention quickly existing comparisons, and then I will come to our study that we did and the quality metrics that we have done so far. And this is still some work in progress, and we will still contribute to that. Now, if we talk about genome informatics, here's what we do at the Functional Genomics Center. The, um, our mission is to provide bioinformatics services and collaborations in the area of omics, so with a focus on next generation sequencing data. So all types of bioinformatics challenges that involve next generation sequencing, but that can also into, uh, involve metabolomics, proteomics, or clinical data where the uh, provide support. And we also maintain and run a cluster, high performance computing environment, cluster and cloud-based, and we also do some software and pipelines. And here on the next graph, I'll just show what is in the brain, what is our um, visualized roughly, what are the ways how we want to make bioinformatics easier for researchers. So it, in my view, I think it depends A, on the bioinformatics skills of the researchers and on the depth of bioinformatics support that we can provide. And the, so there we have a series of shiny web applications. They serve for visualization of various data. And there, this is really for every researcher and pretty much independent of the bioinformatics skills. The idea is that these uh, web interfaces are intuitive and can be easily used by virtually everybody who knows what he wants or she wants to do. When one level higher, we have sushi, uh, our web pipelines where we have a sushi environment. 
uh, but a framework where we can run next generation sequencing data analysis. And if you know what parameters to choose and how to run this, the, uh, and if you really know what to do and you are able to express it, then this is a great tool that gives, lets you from a web browser uh, generate QC reports from your data, realign your data, call SNPs, and so on. And at the end of it, if you run those things, the, at the end of the analysis, you will get a folder with the shell script that has been executed, the parameters, log files, and finally also all the results. So everything is fully documented. You can take it away and further to, uh, use it further for downstream analysis and interpretation. And there we report, support really everything, RNA-seq, de novo, metagenomics, all types of applications. And um, then on top, even for the highly sophisticated users who really need their own environment, where we also have a collection of Linux boxes where they can uh, develop their own scripts on the command line. And finally, on top, um, we offer also collaborations and where we, from our side, provide the most input. And this is, again, helpful for any type of research of whether uh, he has limited bioinformatics skills or whether this is um, by an expert in bioinformatics, these can be fruitful collaborations in all <coughs> sense. That was already all. And here now, there's the overview of the study that we did. Um, that was performed, the study was performed by the genomics research group of the ABIF. ABIF is the Association of Biomolecular Research Facilities. This is an association of core facilities like ours, the Functional Genomics Center. And um, there have been um, there are people from the University of Rochester, Sunny Albany, Harvard, and uh, the University of Zurich involved. And we got uh, also support from uh, BioRad, Illumina, Tenex Genomics, Wafergen, Fluidime, and ABIF, A the ABIF itself. And just because we name, I name these companies, I don't want to express that these are the best companies for single cell technologies. These are just the technologies that we had at hand. Now, let's quickly review what are, what is the status of uh, single cell RNA-seq. It's now already eight years ago that it has first developed and it has been improved over the last years. And there have been some major steps, especially also the introduction of free prime and tagging so that you no longer do full length preamplification and also with free prime and uh, tagging and sequencing you can get very good uh, expression estimates. Also the introduction of UMIs we've seen and these with these UMIs you have unique molecular identifiers that help you to get rid of any PCR duplicates that have been introduced during the amplification. And if you figure it out, you have to do an, a lot of amplifications because a cell will have something like a quarter of a million molecules that you want to sequence. And on the sequencer, you want to produce something like a million reads and there you need some substantial um, amplification. Now, uh, these protocols have been compared by an excellent a uh, paper from uh, Siegenhain and collaborators, in, uh, which has been published this year in Molecular Cell, was also already available in BioArchive last year. And what we see from there is, if you map all protocols that they investigated, they map, they have a substantial amount of reads that actually map to exonic <coughs> regions of the genome and that can therefore contribute to gene expression values. There's also a substantial amount of reads that are mapped, but non-exonic, also unmapped reads. These, all, these fractions are larger than you would expect from bulk sequencing. With bulk sequencing, we expect, for example, easily to have seven, up to 70% of the reads, or even higher. It can be anything between 60 and 90% of the reads that map to exonic reads. With single cell RNAs, sec the number of reads that really come from protein coding exons are smaller. And what you can also see in the top, something like eight protocols that have been analyzed, 
um, there is substantial amount of PCR duplication because the light blue shows you the number of reads that are mapped exonic and the dark blue shows you the number of different UMIs that are those. So this light blue basically are the redundant fraction that you have. This means if you have for cell sec 2 in total, if you have got 1 million reads, you can get something like an estimate when uh, 400,000 reads mapped to exonic and something like only 20,000 reads are really unique in this example. <clears throat> and uh, what this comparison also showed is that something around 1 million reads are enough. The number of detected genes on the right figure shows that saturates um, around 1 million. There are different views on that, but there can be something like between half a million and 5 million you reach saturation. And the graph also shows that there's a substantial difference. Um, that, for example, the drop seek, this is the brownish graph at the bottom end, has one of the lowest uh, sensitivity. It has the lowest number of detected genes if you fix, for example, the sequencing depth. While SmartSec2, also in this comparison, had the highest sensitivity and where with a sequencing depth of one million read, you easily get something like eight or six, nine thousand genes detected. <clears throat> and um, they further um, checked, okay, now every cell is different. We see only 8,000 genes in one cell, but how does it look like if we have a set of cells? If we do a set of cells, do we detect in each cell always the same genes or not? And what has been shown a lot of times, in different cells, you detect different genes. And this is, A, due to different biology, due to the way transcription works, but also due to dropouts, and these dropouts can be uh, also involved, caused by the protocol that just misses these few molecules in uh, the one cell, but not in the other. And the fact that you, if you cumulative leads, if you check what is the cumulative detection of genes in, for example, 100 cells, this still increases. This shows that this dropout process is somewhat random. So, and this also shows that it's really worth sequencing more genes. <clears throat> and then in a second paper by Svensson, which was also published this year, they, detect, they checked what is the actual sensitivity of the protocols, and they used a um, spike-in model for that, where they had uh, uh, spiked-in data also, and with that model, uh, they get estimation that the protocols detect the best protocols like uh, the SMARTER, the CELSEC2, and the STARTSEC. They detect down to something like uh, five molecules in a, in a million reads. They can easily detect the expression for both. So they have really a high sensitivity. And But what this also shows, again, this droplet-based approaches like DropSec or ChemCode, they tend to have a higher detection limit. They need more molecules in the input to be detected. <clears throat> and this is the general. The previous slides was the average. But here, in this graph, they showed that even um, you have a well-defined average, but every cell, the detection limit can be very different from cell to cell, so you have a considerable variation from cell to cell. And in this protocol, in this paper, it's also worth reading, so they compare these full-length protocols versus the tag-counting protocols and uh, check the individual performances. <clears throat> now, this was, these protocols, they focused more mainly on uh, what are the um, Bad lab steps that, uh, that you do after you have the cell isolated. But now we go one step back and want to say, what are the ways, how you can you get actually single cells? So where 
single cell manipulation is around since years. You can do micro pipetting or laser capture micro dissection, or you can uh, do uh, fact sorting. But the first thing, micro pipetting and laser capture, this only works for low number of cells. So if you want to have uh, 10, 20, 100 cells, that's okay. If you want to have thousands of cells, that doesn't fly. Uh, but the good thing is, uh, this would work with any tissue. The bad thing, when it comes to cost, these reactions are in micro liter volumes and the consumables are usually expensive. And there, are, there have been approaches around that do the whole reactions in micro droplets. And if you go into micro droplets, then this reaction goes into nanoliter volumes and the costs for the reagents drop. And then there is also, as a special product, there's this commercially available microfluidics chips from Fluidime C1, and they are designed to handle hundreds of cells, and they can also visualize the cells. They, they work fast, and they do reaction in nanoliter volumes. So there have been these two approaches around for a few years, micro droplets and with microfluidic stations. And, uh, but this obviously triggered some companies to further follow on on that. Here I'll come first to the C1 Autoprep. Uh, I'll show the specs. It's, it's a microfluidic cell manipulation device. You can have it with 96 cells or 800 cells. You can do full length transcript, uh, SmartC2 protocol basically, or you can do free run tech counting. A big drawback is that you have doublets and that you have different chips for specific cell sizes. So uh, you cannot have, if you do a tissue, if you uh, do a tissue disruption and when you have small and small cells, you can't put them all together in the same chip. And then the, the micro droplets, there's been the 10X company that developed this chromium system and where all reactions go in uh, in an emulsion system, in a small drops, where the necessary reagents for cDNA generation are contained and the cell is added. And when you have the first step of the RNA sequencing in these drops, and obviously you can easily have thousands, ten thousands of drops, ten thousands of cells that you can handle, and the reagents are quite cheap and you can have uh, you can process them all in parallel together. So after these two products have been established, others joined the market. Illumina, together with BioRed, developed this DDSEC sure cell protocol. It also works on droplet. Uh, in a, uh, it also has a droplet approach. It can capture between something like 300 and 1,200 cells. It is more flexible in the cell size, up to 5 micron cell size. The protocol does free brand tag counting only, but has UMIs also. And the big plus on that is it gets away without any pre-amplification step. And then uh, another player that joined the market is WaferGen with this iCell 8 system. And that's a different approach. It's a nano dispensing array. And here you have an array of with 5,000 wells, and uh, these wells contain cell barcodes, and the dispenser dispenses individual cells on those wells, and this goes according to a process distribution. So with the dispenser, you usually fill up to 34% of these wells, so that's why you can get between 1,000 and 2,000 cells on one well. The big plus on that is this play, after you dispense the cells, you can visualize the cells, you can check if they are the ones that you want, if they are in a good shape. And you can also select those and sequence only those you're interested in. And while with the other devices, for example, with the DropSig device, all of those drops are end up in the pool and you're going to sequence all. Now, the study design that we used, 
we started out, out with a breast cancer cell line and we had a vehicle treatment and we had an HTAC inhibition with TSA and we did on both also bulk RNA-seq and we used these protocols like uh, these platforms, wafer-chain ICL-8 with Illumina, BioRed, dd sick the Fluidime, C1 chip, with, that has 96 cells and does full length, and the Fluidime C1 chip high throughput that has 800 cells and uh, does only free band tagging and the 10x genomics chromium solution. And these, the different, as you've seen before, these are very different technologies and they've got different strengths in terms of throughput and um, sensitivity. And our design also um, somehow matched that. So for the wafer chain ICL-8, the typical batch size would be that you can use 900 cells in one run. And we did uh, 900 times two on one chip and we did this the whole thing twice. And uh, for the Illumina BioRed, we had 600 um, in, the both, in both batches. Fluidime, we had, you can have up to 96, but uh, with the failure rate, we count on in 80. Uh, with the Fluidime C1, we count on 350. And the 10X Genomics, we uh, think about eight, uh, we targeted around 1,000 uh, cells. The target sequencing depth was also 100,000 reads per cell for each technology, except for the fluid IMC1, where it was uh, 1 million reads per cell because that protocol does full length RNA transcript, uh, has a coverage of the full length transcript. So you obviously need more reads to capture the. The, the molecules. <clears throat> when evaluating such technology, also from a core facility standpoint out, these are the uh, aspects that we were interested in. Um, a, how reliable is such a system? Uh, how, exp um, how, how much can we trust it? Or from this, and from the scientific point, it's more important what transcript sensitivity do we want? Is free time tagging enough, or do I need full length transcripts? Uh, do I also need non coding? Do I need to worry about doublets? Um, from a technical point, is what are UMIs? Can I include UMIs? Can I do deduplication with UMIs? And uh, also, from a technical thing, is how many cells can I get, and what are the to in total the costs? For the evaluation, we looked at the following metrics. What is the transcript home that we cover? What is the diversity of this transcript home? And what is the sensitivity of this detection? How reliable and efficient is it? What fraction of cells and reads are actually usable? And we also checked in out, do we rather want to sequence more reads per cell, or do we have more, a higher number of cells with uh, fewer reads? And the things that we didn't cover here is doublets, and we also didn't cover ERCCs or other spike-ins, because not every technology allows the spike-ins. And we also didn't uh, cover normalization aspects. There are also publications on that. There have been a recent publication again. Uh, where <coughs> I think normalization for single-cell RNA-seq is still a major issue especially if you have a low read coverage and if you have a large number of genes that have, where the expression is exactly zero. Now, the first thing we looked at, what is the strand specificity? So here, all uh, protocols that claim to be strand specific were also highly strand specific, except for the C1 high throughput chip there was a number of cells there that had a considerable amount of reads that were on the wrong strand. And uh, C196 has the strand specificity is 50% um, because this is an unstranded protocol and same for the bulk RNA-seq protocol that we used.
Now, for the mapping rates or mapping targets that we looked at, do, where do the reads go if we are able to align them? And the majority of the reads in our example went to protein coding regions. And this was basically true for all the, for all protocols. So the majority of the reads really come from protein coding exons that we sequence. There are also some reads from pseudogenes. There are some reads short non-coding and mitochondrial ribosomal RNA. But these, in none of the protocol, these had really a major impact. And then here, this is a complicated slide. Um, here I compare what are the informative reads and what are the usable cells in the end. Now, if you look um, on the x-axis, I plot the number of reads. And on the y-axis, I plot the number of usable cells, the number of cells. And for the I cell 8, you see uh, at the top, uh, the uh, dot that shows you that where we have nominal, we have 4,000 cells. So we have a device that claims it can do up to 4,000 cells. And we sequenced that with around 200 million reads. And now, in the end, we looked how many reads were ending up on protein coding axons and how many reads could we actually use. And this was, this you can deduct from the triangle at the bottom. So something like 150 million reads would end up on protein coding exons, which I consider a high efficiency. But the device is made to capture up to 4,000 cells. We had only 1,600 cells where we could get reliable expression values from. So a large number of cells did, were just lost during processes. Did not create libraries, did not create, uh, we didn't detect um, cell barcodes for that, but for those genes, we didn't have enough uh, material for that. So let's say with that, the circle always shows what the what your manufacturer tells you what you can reach, and the triangle shows you what you will actually reach. And uh, for example, uh, what is also remarkable here for the C196 chip, so we had a large fraction of cells that uh, um, nearly all cells were really usable. We had enough reads. We had consistent expression profiles. They none, uh, only a, few, a low number of reads, uh, no, only a low number of cells were excluded in the QC step. And also a large fraction of the reads actually uh, contributed to the expression values. For the C1H2, the efficiency on the sequencing is not as high. We have uh, more reads that come somewhere else that are not protein coding. And the outlier here is a little bit the sure cell, which in terms of cells, most of the cells are usable. But this um, data set has been completely over sequenced. So if because the the, the reads were all duplicate reads that would have, and many, all of these duplicate reads were eliminated in the UMI step. So we only had something like 50,000 different unique, molecule, unique molecules that we could see with, uh, uh, sorry, 50 million in total for all cells. Um, different unique molecules that we sequenced, but we have, this has been sequenced with something like uh, 600 million reads. And why was this done? I mean, this was supported by Illumina, and they said we just put it on a whole flow cell, basically, and uh, um, where the sequencing was not a cost, and they wanted to look very good in this comparison, and so they spent a lot of reads. And it didn't matter. So, but I think it was, this was over sequenced, so, you can produce a lot of reads, but if the diversity is not in your library, this is wasted. But this is also nothing, not that much new. Um, also, the 10x genomics, it also has been over-sequenced to some sense because we have many, much fewer UMIs than we have reads. <clears throat> 
Now, when we look at the expression diversity, this um, shows this uh, violin plots show the number of reads that are spent on the top expressors. So next generation sequencing is a competitive thing. If some highly expressed genes eats all your reads, you don't have sequencing capacity left to sequence the low expressed genes. And how does this happen? This happens if some uh, if the high expressed genes or abundant genes get preferentially amplified, then you will only see this gene and you will see nothing else. And this is true for the IFC 800, which has the uh, highest fraction of, G of reads that go on the top 500 genes. And here you will see we have done a pilot study of this already in 2006. These are labeled with uh, prefix with 2006 and where the values were comparable. So uh, IFC 800, which is the, the C1H uh, high throughput chip, is inefficient because it spends many reads on, uh, it shows signs of overamplification and it spends the majority of the reads on very, very few genes, on 50 genes here. Um, this is true for the uh, high throughput. This is also true uh, for the 10x genomics, where we did 100,000 cell loading. And this is to a certain degree true also for the ICEL 8. And with that respect, the 96, C196 chip is good, and the bulk sequencing, with the bulk sequencing obviously is also good. You have a high diversity, you have less overamplification artifacts. <coughs> now, another aspect of uh, diversity is how many genes are detected. Obviously, with the bulk sequencing, you detect most genes, and the C196 chip is, uh, comes closest. This is also what the, the other papers from C, uh, Siegenhain and Svensson have shown. This uh, SmartSec2 protocol is really a sensitive protocol. Uh, the, after that, the C1H high throughput chip is very sensitive. And on uh, less sensitives are the ICEL-8, the Tenex genomics, and the Shure cells. But this obviously also depends on the sequencing depth. The more you sequence, the higher you have the chance to detect something. And in order to correct for that, we subsampled 20,000 reads or UMIs from each data set. And then we check what is the number of detected genes. And therefore, we try to get out the sequencing depth, this, which influences the detection rate. And uh, now the numbers are more comparable, but you, what you can still see is that bulk sequencing is best. The ranking basically had, did not make change, except for sure cell, um, which, is, which is really a high number of different genes found with, if we take only 20,000 reads. And I think this high diversity comes from the fact that the, the, the sure cell protocol does not do any pre-amplification step and does not lose, uh, does not over-represent individual genes there. Now, we checked also if you go from one cell to the other cell, uh, if you look at different cells, how many genes do we detect cumulatively? Do we, in all cells, do we always miss the same genes or do we detect more genes if you look at different cells? Now these are all the same cells from the cancer thing. This is not like you have different cell types with, um, within t as, we, as you would have from within tissues. So um, we expect smaller variability. And here you see the same plot at the log scale and at, at the linear scale. Again, for comparability, we have 20,000 reads that were subsampled. And what we can see here, the 10 genomics with droplet approach has this lower sensitivity and detects fewer genes. And if you look at a linear scale, what you can learn from there is that the whole thing saturates in our thing <coughs> with something like 200 to 500 genes. So if you have something like 400 genes, you've seen 
most of the um, expression diversity. Now, things have been subsampled for 20,000 reads. And with the 10 genomics uh, technology, if you have 5,000 cells, you tend to sequence low. But if you, and it also, as it's shown before, it doesn't really make sense to sequence more. You don't have a major benefit. But if you take only 96 cells, as, for example, with the fluidine approach, then you can, you still have enough money usually left, or you can still afford to sequence this at the, uh, with higher coverage. And then we do the same plots where we choose, uh, where we take, took all reads, but we have sequenced. So this means about more than a million per cell for the C196. And what you see here is that you have, you really have also a benefit. It is worth to sequence cells that you have produced with the C196, with the SMOTSIC2 protocol, with more than a million reads. And with the other protocols, you'd start to, uh, to saturate earlier. Now, what we also wanted to look at, there's a lot of amplification. Amplification can also be influenced by GC content of the genes. And when we check what is the chance of a gene being detected if it has a low GC content or if it has a high GC content. And what, we, what you see here, the plots in red, this is the chance of detection four genes with a low GC content. And here we took an extremely low GC content below 0.4. The green plots show the genes that have, have a GC content in the, around the center of, between 0.5 and 0.55. And the blue ones are both genes with a very, very high GC content. And here, what becomes apparent, the C196 has a GC bias, also the C1 high throughput chip, but uh, basically, a very small GC bias is present in the 10x genomics and in the sure cell. GC content is also in our bulk RNA-seq protocol and in the isolate. And we further uh, stratified that according to length. Now we have binned the whole, uh, we have binned all genes in a space where we put on the x-axis the GC content and on the y-axis the gene length in log two, at the log two scale. And what we can see here that um, most protocols have a certain bias. For example, the C196 prefers short genes, easily detects um, rather short genes with low GC content. Oh, short genes are on the, so it means on the y-axis very low, uh, rather on the low, and on the x-axis low GC content is on the left. And the very short genes with less than 512 bases, they have been, they hardly been detected. But what you can see here also with sure cell, overall it has a low detection rate, but it detects basically independent of the GC content and length. Now we looked at the <clears throat> big questions what uh, one should do. Should I rather sequence 1,000 cells with a million reads each, or should I sequence 10,000 cells with 100,000 reads each? So these are the trade offs. But you can do cost-wise, it's very, very similar. Um, what we did there is the, we loaded the 10x genomics machine with 1,000 cells, 2,000 cells, 5,000 cells, and 10,000 cells, and always sequenced something like uh, 150 million reads out of it. Uh, yeah, around 150 million reads. And then, uh, this means the number of reads per cell goes down. The more cells you have, the fewer reads per cell you have. And what we wanted to know then, 
if we vary with cell loading, what is our um, detection rate? And what we can see here, if the UMI sequence per cell, which goes up to 60,000 here, if we have, if we increase our sequencing effort up to where we also detect more genes. So it is true if you fill in with 10,000 uh, cells, the whole protocol works. Uh, but if you spend only a low amount of sequencing capacity for it, for it, you also detect only a few number, of, a low number of genes. So it is definitely worth to sequence up to uh, 50,000 UMIs per cell, and which in our approach translated approximately into a half a million reads. You could also uh, bump it up. We didn't do that. I think we, it would have worked. Yeah, it, I think the information is there. Um, but this was limited also. And uh, when we did a T cell, a, a TSNE analysis, where we tried to see if uh, we can separate the cells. And with, if you have a thousand cell loading, we can easily separate it, these two uh, conditions. That was no problem at all. Uh, if you use these 2,000 cells with uh, lower sequencing depth, then we could still separate the two conditions. But we, what we saw here is that there are two subgroups. And this is because the whole thing has been done in two batches. And these are the two batches. I don't have a plot for you, but these are the two batches. And the, here, the, the green cloud is also clearly two batches. Um, yeah, that explains the substructure. Then, if we, in our sequencing, if we use this 5,000 5, cell loading, then this separation becomes unreliable. And we can no longer clearly satis uh, classify all the cells correctly. And if you use this 10,000 cells loading that we use, this low density uh, coverage sequencing when everything was gone. So when there was no sensitivity around to discriminate the two, the two types. But this is exactly what, uh, for example, the Penex genomics people advertise, that it's enough to sequence uh, 10,000 reads or 20,000 reads or at most 50,000 reads for it, because they want that you spend your money on the 10x reagents and not on the sequencing. <laughs> I guess if you ask an Illumina representative, it's going to be exactly the other way around. And I think this, and there has been in this paper out that really showed that with as many, as low numbers of 20,000 reads, you can classify different cell types from each other. But I think you, from our study, I think you really have to see what is your classification task at hand that you want. Um, what sensitivity do you need? And I would start, I would feel safer if you start with some at least 100,000 reads or rather half a million reads per cell to get a feeling if what is the number of reads that you need for your research question. But uh, where the, the demands may definitely vary from, uh, from case to case. Uh, conclusions, um, all technologies allowed with uh, successful uh, single cell RNA-seq experiments. I think that different technologies satisfy different needs in terms of detection sensitivity. If you go for detection, if you want high sensitivity, you can also, we also had very good experience with this manual plate-based SmartSeq2 protocol. Um, but if you have a higher demand on cell throughput, uh, then you might want to go for a different technology. And this also depends on the costs that you have and on the batch sizes that these technologies provide. There is a coverage bias present, and this obviously is more stronger, more stronger than the, as compared to bulk RNA sequencing. And the droplet-based methods provide this highest throughput in terms of cells, uh, but at the cost of the gene detection sensitivity. And uh, with this, 
I want to thank all those that have <laughs> contributed to this study, and I want to also acknowledge the whole Function Genomics Center that supported this work. And I'm open for questions if they are here or from your uh, online attendees. <laughs>